Ginger and I, my wife, uh, occasionally attend the Friday night Celebrate Recovery meetings at New Covenant Church. We were there the last Friday, or the first Friday in June, and that's the first time that Michael and I met each other, although I've seen Michael on several other occasions. That's the first time that we actually met and shook hands with each other and spoke with each other. Well, as a result of that, before I went home that evening, ended up preaching here at the Wildwood Church. <laughs> if I hadn't have been there that Friday night, I wouldn't be here today. So, you know, it's just those kind of things happen, don't they? You're just there, and something happens, and if you hadn't have been there, it wouldn't have happened. I hope it's a good thing that Michael invited me to preach this morning because I'm here, and, and you are here to listen to me, and uh, I hope that when Michael hears this and sees this on the DVD, he says, boy, I'm glad I invited John to do that, instead of saying, oh my goodness, what did I do? I'll never do that again. Anyway, I'm glad to be here this morning. I was here last Sunday with my wife, Ginger, to get to meet a lot of you and appreciate your hospitality. It makes it a lot easier for me to be back here this morning as the preacher. As I look over the congregation this morning, I, I'm thinking that a lot of you can uh, remember the year 1977. Uh, and if you are old enough to remember the year 1977, you may also remember a very outstanding vocal duo, Simon and Garfunkel. They produced a lot of really popular music back in the 1970s. And in 1977, Paul Simon wrote a song that produced a sermon title for this sermon today. The song was titled, Slip Sliding Away. It was a very popular song. And there was a chorus to this song that said, slip sliding away, slip sliding away, the nearer your destination, the more your slip sliding away. The last two lines of that song read, we're working our jobs, collecting our pay, believe we're gliding down the highway, when in fact, we're sliding away. Well, that's not very encouraging, is it? It doesn't sound very good. Back in the early days of, uh, of Methodism, I mean the really early days of Methodism, uh, we applied this in a spiritual sense to our lives if we weren't doing very well in our relationship with the Lord and referred to it as backsliding. But I like the term slip sliding away as opposed to backsliding. Backsliding, I think, has more of a negative sound. I would hate to go up to somebody and say, I think you're backsliding. It's easier for me to say, you might be slip sliding away. You need to be a little bit careful about that. I'm thinking of Hebrews chapter 1039, which is a part of our scripture lesson this morning. He talks about backsliding, although he doesn't use that term. The writer says, we are not like those who turn away from our God to our own destruction. We are faithful ones whose souls will be saved. And that's the purpose of this message this morning. To inspire us not to be slip sliding away, but to be among God's faithful ones. Many times when I'm attending a funeral or a memorial service, and uh, a eulogy is spoken, and many times people are invited to come up and tell some a lot of good things about this person. I think I wish I had known that person better. I wish I had really got to know that person because he or she was really a wonderful person. I, I think I could have really benefited from knowing that person a lot more than I knew them. I wish we could kind of go back in time and start over again so that I had a chance to get to know those people better. There are 14 people mentioned in the New Testament that I feel the same way about. These people are mentioned usually only once. We don't know very much about them. Uh, I wish the Bible had told 
us more about who these people are. These are the 14. Probably won't recognize the names of most of them. Tychicus, Aristarchus, Justus, Epaphras, Nymphus, Ocupus, Stephanus, Fortunatus, Achaeus, Ephroditus, Erastus, Eubulus, Claudia, Demas. These are people whom we don't know very much about, except one thing we know about them, and that is they were partners with Paul in his ministry of establishing new churches around the Mediterranean world. Whenever Paul spoke of them, which may have been only once in our Bibles, he gave them high praise. He appreciated what they were doing, the help they were giving, the contribution that they were making to the early church. These people were actively involved in helping the church spread rapidly under Paul's leadership. I want to focus just on one of these 14 people this morning, the man Demas. There are two places in the New Testament where Demas is referred to in a positive way by the Apostle Paul. In Paul's letter to Philemon, he wrote, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner for Christ Jesus sends you greeting, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow prisoners. That's good company, Mark and Luke. We know that Demas served the church in Rome while Paul was in prison there, and he was a valuable part of the church, working closely, hand in hand, with the Apostle Paul. And so in Colossians 4.14, Paul wrote, Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. We get the impression from that that they're, they were just really thick with each other, working hand in hand together. However, the third time that we, we read about Demas, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, there's been a big change in Paul's reference to him there. Paul wrote Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. How sad. That is. After knowing that Demas worked closely with Paul in establishing the church and was with him there in Rome while Paul was in prison, to think that somehow he got so sidetracked that he actually deserted Paul and left the church. So now all that we remember about Demas is that he loved the present world. I'll call this brief story of Demas the Demas Syndrome because there are stories like this today still happening in the church. There are instances where people become weary in their service to Christ, or they become discouraged or disillusioned for some reason and leave the church. Others become mad at the pastor, or they become mad at some person or some group within the church and they just leave. Now, I'm not talking about people who decide to go to some other church. That's a whole different kind of situation. I'm talking about people who just quit going to church completely. They don't want anything to do with the church anymore. And many times in the process of making that decision that they don't want anything to do with the church anymore, they also decide they don't want anything to do with God anymore. And just like it was with Demas, it's really a sad, sad story when that kind of thing happens. Paul understood that this could happen. I believe when he wrote in Galatians 6, 9, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if if we do not lose heart. We live in a world where we're confronted with many, many difficulties. We must deal with sinful influences and many different kinds of temptations. And all of us here, each one of us here this morning, face a problem of some kind or another. And if we're not immediately facing a problem, we've just come out of a problem, we know we're going into a problem because that's life, dealing with problems. We're like that as human beings. And so there's a possibility, because of all of this, that any one of us can become sidetracked 
And any one of us could be like Demas and leave the church and leave God behind in our thinking and in our hearts. Any one of us could drop out of serving Christ. And so, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, thinking about this kind of thing that could happen to any one of us. Those who think they are standing need to watch, or else they might fall. Once when Jesus was teaching his disciples about his return to earth, he said, because of the increase of wickedness, the hearts, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands to the end will be saved. That's really an awesome thought that the love of most will grow cold. Which leads me to believe that there's a possibility that any one of us here this morning could have that same experience that Demas had and leave the church and leave God behind. I'm thinking of a good friend of mine who was a pastor in the Free Methodist Church. We saw each other frequently. We played golf together once a week. And then as Methodist preachers do, I got moved to the opposite side of the state. And after a while, I lost track of him. Until one day, years later, I was sitting in my office at the church I was serving at the time, which happened to be in downtown Toledo, Ohio. And there was a knock on the door, and in walked my old-time free Methodist pastor friend. I said, what are you doing here? He said, well, I work just down the street. I'm the custodian at the YMCA. I mean, there's nothing wrong or dishonorable about being custodian of the YMCA, but God had called this man to be a preacher, to be a pastor, and at one time he was doing a marvelous job. I asked him what had happened. He said, my wife divorced me. I couldn't handle that. I just fell apart. I lost my church because I fell apart. I decided I didn't want anything to do with the church anymore, and God couldn't have kept that from happening. I didn't want anything to do with God anymore. And it's been years and years and years since I've gone to church anywhere. I said, well, you're working right down the street. Why don't you come to this church? This is a wonderful church. He never came. I invited him to have lunch with me. He never accepted the opportunity. I invited him to come to our house and have dinner with my wife and me, but he never accepted that invitation. He didn't want anything to do with the church or even another pastor anymore. I'm thinking of a couple who sat on the front row of the church every Sunday. You knew when you went to that church, they were going to be sitting right there in the front row, right in front of the pastor. Suddenly they weren't there anymore. One concludes, well, they must be sick, they must have encountered some kind of a problem. I was fortunate enough to be able to contact them and talk with them and said, what happened? Are you mad at somebody? Are you sick? Uh, were you injured by the church in some way? No. We just got too busy. We don't have time to go to church anymore because we just got too busy. That's been at least two years ago. And they still love to come back to church. Another sad, sad story. I'm thinking of a man who was a part of the church that I served. And one Sunday I was greeting the people before the service began, just as Pastor Michael does, going up the aisle and shaking hands with people, as many people as he can shake hands with. I was doing something like that. And suddenly I realized that it was time for the service to start and I needed to be up in front. So I just quit greeting the people and went to the front of the church so I could start the service. He wasn't there the next Sunday. He wasn't there the Sunday after that. And so I made a call at their house and found out that he had quit going to church because he said, you didn't speak to me last Sunday. He spoke to all these other people, and you did not speak to me. <laughs> of course, I tried to make excuses for myself. 
told him why I had quit reading to people, tried to get him back in church. All the years that I was at that church, he never went to church again. Never went to any church again. Sad, sad story. I'm thinking of my granddaughter, who was raised in the church. Her father was a pastor. She's a granddaughter by marriage, by the way. She met my grandson, who later became her husband, at a Bible study in a Pentecostal church in Michigan. They went together for three years before they got married, went to church every Sunday, went to the Bible study, sang in the choir, got married, hadn't been married for two years yet, when last May she left him. For a man that she met playing word games on the internet, and he took her to Ecuador. And she's not going to church, of course. Here was a young lady who was raised in the church, who went to church every Sunday, who went to Bible study every week, who sang in the choir, even sang some solos in the church, and suddenly she's not in church anymore. One of those sad, sad stories. Not many of you remember that old hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. The last verse says, Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. So that's not an uncommon feeling, apparently, to get sidetracked for some reason and just leave the church and leave God behind. There are many people who were once in church every week but something happened to sidetrack them. Many of them took their focus off of Jesus and focused on other people or other things. And some of them are not in church today because they found fault with the church. And, and many of these people would have thought, that will never happen to me. That's the last thing on my mind that I would quit going to church. But they did. They became dropouts. <coughs> and it happens too often in the body of Christ, I'm afraid. The scripture lesson this morning mentions some experiences that these Christians we're going through that the author of Hebrews are writing to. He said they are suffering from an enormous amount of pressure. He said you are being exposed to insults and abuse in public, and you have had your, con your, your possessions confiscated. And yet he said you have remained faithful. If you had any reason to leave the church and to turn your backs on God, well, you had plenty of reasons to do that, but you didn't. You remained faithful and stayed with the church and stayed with God. Because that temptation is possible for all of us, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, we need to take precautions against this happening to us. A Gallup poll in the 1990s was conducted in one of the major denominations. I'd like to think that it was not a United Methodist church. I'd like to think it was a Presbyterian church or an Episcopal church or a Lutheran church but it could have been United Methodist. It said that 20% of the church members never pray, 25% never read their Bible, 30% seldom attend public worship, 40% never give any money to the church, 50% never attend an adult class offered in their church, 90% never have personal devotions, and 95% have never invited anyone to come to church with them. So it's no wonder that the Demas Syndrome is all too common in the church today. There's an ancient story that comes out of Saudi Arabia. There was a highly trained cavalry unit known as the King's Guard. Only the best horses and riders were chosen for this assignment. And these horses were put through, through very difficult routines and one thing was absolutely important, they must always obey the trainer. The trainer always had a whistle around his neck. And whenever he blew that whistle, the horses must stop whatever they were doing and immediately return to the trainer. At the end of this training period, there was one more test. 
the horses were taken to the edge of the desert and put, up on a, put in a paddock on a hill. At the bottom of this hill was a spring-fed lake there in the desert. And the horses were kept without any food or water for 48 hours. At the end of the 48 hours, the paddock gate was open. And you know what the horses did. They ran as fast as they could down the hill to the spring-fed lake. And just before the horses got there, the trainer blew his whistle. And only those horses that stopped immediately and turned around and came back to the trainer and said it would fit for that cavalry unit that he was by. Well, I kind of believe that that's the kind of obedience the Bible is calling us to. It's as the songwriter said in the old gospel song, trust and obey, for there's no other way. Therefore, I hope that the writer of Hebrews chapter 10 and 39, describing to us here this morning when he wrote, we are not among those who shrink back. He could have said we are not among those who give up. We are not among those who quit. We are not among those who shrink back, he said, but among those who have faith and so are saved. And I love Jude 1.24. God is able to keep you from falling away. And he will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fall. But a glorious first that is. God is able to keep us from falling away. And he will bring us with great joy into his glorious presence. <laughs> This seems almost impossible, doesn't it, without a single fault. May all of us be able to say, therefore, that the Apostle Paul did near the end of his life, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That is pray. Lord, I pray that if you ever get to the point in life where Demas arrived, tempted to walk out, to say, I've had it. I don't want anything else to do with the church anymore, that your Holy Spirit will catch us in that moment and stop us in our tracks and help us turn around and come back to the church and back to you. Keep us faithful, Lord, in all the things that we do for you and for the church. May we be faithful to our very last day upon this earth who were received into your glorious presence. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen.